it's it's wonderful to be here, and um, it's a real honour for me, just on behalf of the Irish government, um, to get to express some of our appreciation and thanks for everything that you're doing here to the council, Dennis, Mike. Um, David, um, with the fund and Kieran and Loretta, and, and everyone, all our friends here in Palm Beach, just to say how much we appreciate the remarkable work you're doing on behalf of Ireland. Thank you, Paul. Always good to see you, Paul. Thanks for coming down here. Um, Wilbur is a native of New Jersey. Wilbur um, went to Catholic Xavier High School, and then on to Yale, and then he got his MBA from Harvard. Uh, when Wilbur took a big stake in the Bank of Ireland, um, it was such a, a vote of confidence that such a sophisticated American investor saw value in Ireland at a time when they were, they were really not doing very well. And um, I remember last year, uh, they asked Wilbur, was it a good buy? He said, I'm going to give you a tip, buy the stock last year, and so the stock is up over 35% since Wilbur gave us the tip last year. So I don't know what he's going to say this year, but Wilbur, please come up. Mike isn't quite right. I didn't say everybody should buy the stock. My compliance department would have shut me down if I had, <laughs> had said that. All I said was that I wasn't selling mine, and I'm still not. So. <laughs> Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman famously said, if you put the government in charge of the Sahara Desert, pretty soon you'd have a shortage of sand. <laughs> I agree with his general assessment of government's ability to run anything, but I think the present Irish government is an exception to that general rule. The predecessor government, which had ruled Ireland since World War II, clearly failed to notice that something was amiss when real estate appreciated 330% over a 12-year period. They also watched idly as the loans of Irish banks doubled from 2001 to 2010 and ultimately totaled 179% the size of the total economy. Worse yet, regulators permitted loans to deposit ratios to balloon from 117% to as high as 175% in the case of Bank of Ireland. As a practical matter, this meant that more than 40% of the bank's loans were financed with short-term hot money and were therefore vulnerable to any loss of investor confidence. In fairness to that government, when the bubble burst, they did promptly guarantee all deposits, seek a bailout, and impose severe austerity. And they did so knowing that it would cause major political problems for them. It did. They lost the next election. But unlike the Club Med country, there were no riots or nationwide strikes. Ireland is not an economy that is dysfunctional or has deteriorated over decades. Instead, Ireland's problem was very specific. The 64 billion euros it paid to bail out the banks. The new government maintained the austerity and enforced a variety of strict measures, including a 15% reduction in the total cost of civil service, something our government might think about imitating. The carbon tax alone, which they put in, provided some 400 million euros of new revenues, one-fourth the total needed under the bailout agreement, and simultaneously reduced carbon emissions in the country by 6.7 percent, a remarkable pair of achievements. The administration also has introduced several measures to stimulate the economy. These included exemption from the mortgage tax throughout 2012 for all first-time buyers. And that caused a rise in home sales especially as year-end approached. 
They also waived all income tax on pay between 70,000 euros and 500,000 euros for the first three years a foreign executive worked in Ireland, thereby encouraging inbound migration. In addition, they permitted banks to carry over to a new mortgage the excess balance of their old loan above fair market value. This helps buyers with strong income to move to a more expensive residence, even though the first one was underwater. Finally, they tentatively agreed to drop by March 31st the requirements that banks pay government huge fees for guarantees of deposits in excess of 100,000 euros. This ELG program cost Bank of Ireland 388 million euros last year. In addition, the government cooperated with Irish banks in redundancy programs. The regulators initiated a probe of the fitness of bank executives who were in place pre-crash, but were judicious and did not make it into a witch hunt. They did, however, impose a compensation cap of 500,000 euros per year on bank executives and adhered to it even when Allied Irish asked for a waiver. I'm grateful they put that cap on. It made personnel decisions simpler. These moves recognize the reality that the economy cannot regain its health until the banks themselves are healthy. Government has tried to stimulate investment in small and medium-sized enterprises by having the National Pension Fund co-invest in mezzanine and venture capital funds. And this week, government authorized in its financial bills that were passed, REITs to help property values recover. The country's leader, Enda Kenny, has been active in soliciting foreign direct investment. And partly as a result, 2012 was a record year for inbound foreign direct investment into Ireland a remarkable one-seventh of all the jobs in Ireland are now related to foreign direct investment situations. The most important industry in Ireland is pharmaceuticals, which are both the largest taxpayers and the largest sources of exports. Those little blue pills that give so many people in this room such great pleasure <laughs> mostly come from Ireland. Gross exports are 105 percent of the Irish gross domestic product. And the net trade balance, favorable trade balance, is about 5 percent of the economy. 8 billion euros favorable trade balance, another all-time record. In addition to pharmaceuticals, medical devices, IT equipment and software, Ireland exports uh, agriculture, internet games, internet betting, and financial services. You might have seen the little incident in Rome the other night on TV where one of the betting parlors was taking bets on who would be the new pope until the Vatican police shooed them away. I think it was really restraint of trade. <laughs> Ireland's financial services include back office functions for many of the world's largest financial institutions and they're also a major player in global leasing of aircraft. Ireland's low tax rates are a big reason for the foreign direct investment, and France tried in vain to coerce it to raise rates as a quid pro quo for the bailout, but government staunchly resisted. Fortunately, the EU cannot force an individual member state to raise taxes. Enda Kenny, who just wrote it, rotated in as president of the EU, aggressively campaigned for 18 months to modify the terms of the EU, ECB, and IMF bailout so that the loan would have lower interest rates and longer maturities. He succeeded. 
On February 7, the Irish government announced an agreement with the European Central Bank, who went along with it quite grudgingly, I might add, to refinance the 31 billion euros of promissory notes issued in connection with the bailouts of Anglo-Irish Bank and the Irish Nationwide Building Society. The original notes had very quick maturities, 3 billion, 100 million every March until 2023, and then with declining amounts after 2023 till the final maturity in 2031. The new bonds will have a final maturity in 2053, so a huge extension in final maturity, but more importantly, no amortization of principal until 2038. The interest rate has also been dealt with. It's now just a bit over 3%, 500 basis points, 5 percentage points reduction from the present one. That alone provides a billion and a half euros annual savings to the government, plus the re relaxation of repayment schedule means that's 3.1 billion euros per year less that Ireland will have to refinance in the public capital markets. So it's a huge uh, help to the government's ba balance sheet and income statement. The deal also enabled the government to liquidate the IBRC, which was a kind of holding pen for the assets and liabilities of the failed banks. And they had on that IBRC exposure of about a billion euros because of their guarantees of the deposits over 100,000 euros. So the New Deal took that liability and rolled it also into this new long-term loan. Finally, and something for which I'm also grateful, the deal repaid Bank of Ireland for the 3.4 billion of government debt due in 2025 that our bank had repoed for the government last year to give them a little breathing spell. In short, it cleans up the three major financial problems that had been clouding Ireland's picture. This is a really big win for the people of Ireland, and it also augurs well for Bank of Ireland. It caused Standard & Poor's to revise its outlook for the Irish sovereign from negative to stable. And those of you familiar at all with ratings, that's a very, very big deal in and of itself. Whatever doubts anyone may have had about Ireland's ability to exit from the bailout this year now have been eliminated.